Thank you. So let me introduce our speakers, and I'll be brief because you have uh, you have their bios in your in your program. But let me introduce to you Sue Gardner, Executive Director, Wikimedia Foundation. She will be interviewed by Dr. Jennifer Chapman. Now, Sue, it really is, a, a, in every sense of the word that I understand, a path-bending leader. She joined Wikimedia Foundation in 2007. It is a site with over 400 million users each month. It was managed by just seven people at the time in a strip mall in Florida, I understand. Um, you've seen some of the ways she's been described in her bio. What is she about? She is about ensuring that everyone in the world has free and easy access to the information they want and need. That's a nice purpose. She'll be interviewed by Dr. Jennifer Chapman, Jenny Chapman, a friend and colleague of mine. She's a world expert in the area of organizational culture. She taught me that leaders set culture. She helped me and many of our students understand what that means. I mean, what are the levers? How do leaders set culture? How does that work? Why does culture matter? She is one of our very, very best faculty members and very, very focused on leadership in particular. So I'm delighted to have both of them here today. Jenny, Sue, thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You. I moved my microphone. <laughs> I might have broken it. <laughs> well. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all. Welcome. Um, and welcome to you. Thank you so much for taking a, a treasured Saturday morning to uh, spend some time with us. I have a, a set of questions, and then we also have um, the questions that you'll write on your, your card. So it should be a, a dynamic uh, uh, period here. But let me start with a big question. Uh, this is a conference about path bending leadership and uh, the, the team was so interested in inviting you to come because in our minds you exemplify path bending leadership. Um, and I think of our four defining principles, uh, beyond yourself is a really important one, but there are others I, we think also that, that you exemplify. But let me just ask about your, what we know to be your main, your main vision, um, which is to provide open access for information to anyone, anywhere in the world. And I'm really interested in how you came upon that view, how that evolved as part of your mindset, your philosophy, um, something that you've become so passionate about. What parts of that vision have been stable over time? What have you updated on? What has evolved? That's so interesting. That's such an interesting question, and it's a big question. Big question. <laughs> um, so I, um, I, 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 when I was young, I wanted to be a journalist, um, and that was because of Woodward and Bernstein and stuff like that, right? Um, the, the model of journalism that was, we used to say, afflict the company comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That was what I believed in. That was what I was raised to believe in, muckraking and that kind of thing, speaking truth to power. Um, and I'm a Canadian, which means by American standards, I'm a socialist, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, so, and so that was what I always believed in. And, uh, and uh, back when I started my career, how you did that was old school journalism, right? You went out and you made a radio documentary or you wrote a story and it was published in the newspaper. And it was only when the internet came along and um, it became possible for ordinary people to own the means of production that it became possible for something like Wikipedia to exist, which was, in my view, um, just a better way of doing the same thing, right? You used to need a gatekeeper. You used to need somebody who was paid to go out and do the work, and now it was possible to just provide tools and people could do the work themselves and share with each other without needing an intermediary, right? So for me, the, 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 I feel like my path and what I wanted to do has always been the same. And over the course of my career, technology has changed to make it possible to do it way better than we could originally do it. So I feel like I'm still doing the same thing, it's just I'm doing it differently. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to go back and forth between huge questions and small questions. So this question is, um, why do you think you got the Wikimedia job? So you came from, from 
the CBC and, and you had um, great experience as the head of, the, of digital media there, so, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and Wikimedia was this small organization. I'm interested in what attracted you to it and why you think the board was interested in you, where, how the match came about. Yeah, that's also a very good question. And I, I think that um, we have a temptation to make our stories make sense, right? So I have a temptation to want to look back and say, yes, it all made perfect sense. This happened, and of course, then that right. happened. And you know, it all is very um, meaningful and coherent. And it is meaningful, but it's not coherent. <laughs> um, what actually happened was, uh, I, my part of the story was somewhat coherent. I was at the CBC, I was running the CBC's website. Uh, media is going through all kinds of crises, financial crises and other forms, business model crises, but also audience crises, what are we for? And uh, the CBC had been in uh, decline from a revenue perspective. The government um, grants were being cut back. And so the, the CBC was declining in influence. And it had been declining in influence even when I first started back in 1990. And I was feeling like I, many of my colleagues were a lot older than me. Most people who work at the CBC have been there a long time. I was too young to retired in that, right? It was, it was not what I should do. And so I was working at the internet, I was running the website, and um, I was looking around and like, who's doing public service on the internet? Is public service even happening on the internet? I found out that Wikipedia was run by a nonprofit, which was revelatory to me. I had no idea. I had never thought about Wikipedia's business model. I did not know it was funded by donations. I didn't know that it had a serious intent. I didn't know what it was. I hadn't thought about it very much. Um, and when I found out what it was, it was obvious to me that that was a thing that I should do. And it was particularly obvious to me because um, as I came to discover, it was run out of a strip mall in Florida. It was just seven people, mostly in their 20s. It was so small, the, the foundation, it was so clearly unable to uphold its responsibilities with a really important website to operate it well, right? That I had built cbc.ca from a very tiny thing into a moderately sized and competent news organization. And I knew I could do that because I had done it before. So I thought, okay, so it's this awesome, amazing thing, this amazing idea that is actually having an extraordinary, real impact on the world. And the organization behind it is broken and I can help fix it. So for me, it was a no-brainer, right? Um, from the perspective of the board, I wish that I could say they looked at me and they thought, Yes. <laughs> you know? Like, you're so clearly, having given it a lot of thought, you are so clearly what we need, uh -huh. you know. Um, but part of what it's like to be a small, broken organization is that you're not very intentional. And so I, I flew to New York and I met with two of our board members. The board members of the Wikimedia Foundation are majority elected by Wikipedians. Um, and so one of the board members who met with me was a law student at George Washington, and the other was a guy who ran. Um, educational technology nonprofit in the Netherlands. And they met with me and we had lunch in a coffee shop. And then I said, I said, so what are we going to do next? How do we figure out whether to move forward with this or how do we feel about this? And they said to me, why don't you take a walk around the block? And when you come back, I really, Jan Bart said, I really like you and I think she really likes you too. So why don't you take a walk around the block and when you come back, we'll let you know what we think. <laughs> And I went for a walk around the block and I phoned my best friend and mentor and I said, what am I going to do with this, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and then I came back and they said, um, they said, we really like you, let's do this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So then, so then you get to Wikimedia, which started, what, around five people or so when you, yeah. Yeah. And you built it quickly to an organization of 50. You, in 50 days, raised $16 million. Um, uh, so you're like a serious leader, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> right? And, and, and these, are, these are kind of uh, transformative um, uh, outcomes. So, so are you a deliberate leader? How, how did you become a good leader. It's a crazy question to ask the person who, she's obviously a very um, humble, 
Uh, so confidence without attitude is also another description. So I hesitate to ask you why you're so wonderful, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really asking, you, you know, how how did your judgment about organizations and what calls to make and um, sort of these these leadership decisions that that in retrospect look very, very extraordinary and very rational and linear and so on and so forth. So do you feel like you're a leader who was born or this is just something that you can do naturally or are there things that you did to actually build your leadership capability? Yeah, I was not born to it. Um, in fact, I'm kind of a late bloomer, and so I was I was a journalist for 10 years. And, you know, Ira Glass, do you, you guys know who Ira Glass yeah, is, right? He was here in life. Oh, yeah? Excellent He's life, yeah. so great. And he said this beautiful thing about how when you first start doing something, you suck at it for a long time, right? <laughs> and, and, and it's true. When I was a journalist, I sucked as a journalist for a long time. Like, I was okay, right? But I was just not great. And then, um, and then when I was first a boss, I I sucked at that too, right? And um, and and it, it's learned. A friend of mine told me it's learned behavior, and I think that's true. Like I think I think there, it's very rare for people to be naturally good at it because it requires a lot of deliberate, um, in, a lot of intentionality in how you conduct yourself, combined with authenticity, which is a weird thing. But um, yeah. but what I so so so. I think there were two things that really helped me. I think one was, I referenced before my old friend and mentor, um, and he was a, is a person of enormous personal integrity, and he was my boss, and he was such a good boss. And he spent, I don't know, like you know the Malcolm Gladwell thing about how you have to spend 80,000 yeah. or whatever hours doing anything to get good at it. And he spent probably 80,000 hours talking to me about leadership. <laughs> Seriously. Like, we were, and we were, we were good friends, so we enjoyed it, right? It was fun, like we had coffee and stuff, like we enjoyed it. But he spent 1,000 hours, and, and he did me the courtesy and the, gave me the gift of being totally honest with me. So I would say, so we would go through scenarios, and I would say, so this is happening, and this guy's doing this thing, and I'm not sure if I project in the future, I think something will happen, blah, 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 and I would sort of go through it. And he would say, oh my God, you are so stupid. <laughs> you know? and, and, then, and then we would kick it around, and then, and then he would predict, and then things would happen that were accurate, that he had accurately predicted, and then I would respect him a little bit more and listen yeah, to yeah, him a yeah, bit more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so so that, that was super helpful. And then the other thing was, um, I'm a big believer in the blunt, horrible honesty of 360 yeah. degree feedback uh -huh. instruments, um, because you see yourself reflected back through other people's eyes and that is it, it's painful but it's helpful yeah. right so that has also been useful to me yeah great great yeah. and are there other um, so so you had the help of a great mentor are there other people that you admire as leaders do you did you do you sort of scan the environment and sort of see who's interesting and try to uh, uh, emulate their practices or get to know them or yeah, I, I used to do that more than I do it today. And, and, and ultimately, what I felt like was you can only be the best version of yourself. You can't be a bad version of somebody else because you can't do it well, right? Um, I had a guy at the CBC who I really admired and thought was a really terrific leader, but his style was really different from mine. And I tried to model myself for a couple of years on his style. Um, he was a very intimidating person. And um, <clears throat> I, I really realized aping him uh, that that for the game is different for women than it is for men right and so what read for example he had this tactic where he would be completely silent in a meeting and eventually all eyes would turn to him and everybody would want to know what he thought because he was holding back and when I tried to do that, people just ignored me <laughs> because I was small and young and female, right? So, so yeah, I mean, there are lots of people who inspire me. There are lots of people who I think are super interesting, um, but, but I, don't, I don't try to model myself on them. Yeah. So, so um, the, the gender issue is, of course, interesting and of particular interest to this audience. Um, and you're working in, I guess, what we could say is a, a fairly male-dominated <laughs> domain. Um, uh, and wh how generally do you think that uh, distribution has 
provided opportunities for you or and or constraints? I mean, placing yourself in that. I, kn I know you're only a woman and you've probably only been a woman. So it's, <laughs> right? So it's hard to ask, what's it like being a woman, right? Because you're, you're the fish in the water, right? Mm -hmm. But um, w it, from, from a kind of general perspective, how do you think that has played out for you? Um, I think that a, uh, a, a, a woman acting purely out of rational self-interest would not work in technology, right? Because it's, it's hard, right? I mean, it's hard because you, um, it, it is extremely male-dominated. The culture is shaped by values that are typically male. Um, and, and there's just lots of overt sexism. I mean, I was astounded when I came to the Bay Area. I'm from Toronto, and I worked for the CBC for a long time, and the CBC was a very female-friendly environment. We used to joke that in the Second World War, the men went off to war, the women took all their jobs. When the men came back from war, the women refused to give the jobs back, right? <laughs> so the CBC had women in leadership positions, women at every level of the organization. We sometimes had a hard time recruiting men. Um, and... <laughs> It's true, and it tells you what public broadcasting pays, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, so I was shocked when I came here. I was shocked. One of the first things that I did when I moved to the Bay Area was I did a tour of potential major donors, and so I drove around Silicon Valley meeting with rich people, all different manners of rich people, asking them for money for the Wikimedia Foundation, and I didn't meet a single woman except literally people bringing us drinks in boardrooms, literally. I. I couldn't believe it. Um, so I don't think a rational woman acting in purely in her own self-interest would work in technology, would work in this space. Um, but I do think that we have a, uh, an obligation to do it um, because technology is the force um, shaping society right now. And, and it's painful um, that it is so yeah. shaped purely by a masculine perspective, a male perspective. Um, and so women have an obligation to be represented and to be helping to shape the world, helping to influence the world in that way. Um, but it's, you know, I sometimes wonder what year it is in Silicon Valley, you know? Like, is it 1972? Yeah. Is it 1980? I yeah. don't know, you know? Nice. Um, so we have some fun questions from, from the audience. Um, this is one. My high school and junior high, and I like it because I have a high school daughter. My high school and junior high high schools are not allowed to use Wikipedia in their school project research. What is your response to that policy? Yeah. <laughs> I bet you get that a lot. It's a very common question. <laughs> um, yeah. As I understand it, uh, nobody is supposed to cite any encyclopedia in their school projects, right? Like encyclopedias, whether it's Britannica or Wikipedia, um, encyclopedias are supposed to be a jumping off point uh, for research. You're not supposed to cite them because they're a generalist tertiary, I guess, source. Um, but the idea underpinning the question is more, I think, is Wikipedia respected yet? Right? And um, the answer to that question is that Wikipedia does become more respected all the time, right? When I joined in 2007, we were, uh, we were still reeling from a number of kind of editorial controversies. The New Yorker, there was an SJ scandal and the Siegenthaler scandal. I don't know if you guys remember that. Um, and, uh, and, and so the place was pretty rocky from a credibility perspective. I think that's normal for any disruptive innovation, right? It, it happens and people don't know what to make of it. They have to figure out what are the social implications? Is this thing good or bad? And so we spent time as a society, right, trying to figure out what is the impact of Wikipedia? Is it good for us or is it bad? And I think the answer is resoundingly, obviously, come to be understood to be it is good, you know? And I think that every year teachers, librarians, you know, people in positions of influence get more comfortable with it because they use it and it works and they like it. Yeah. Um, we were talking about this earlier as a, as a person who studies organizations. Uh, Wikimedia is a very interesting organization uh, in that you have your staff who you ostensibly have some <laughs> say over, right? right? You control some, some aspects of their work, work life. And then you have your editors, this huge, widely cast network of people who don't work for you, but who represent your organization to the outside world. And I'm just interested in how you've managed to, um, to generate a cohesive community and 
Um, I know there are issues about what gets written where and, and so forth, but, but how do you manage that kind of an organization? Yeah, it's really, really interesting. And we think of it as a movement, right? So we think of ourselves as being the Wikimedia Foundation being part of the Wikimedia movement. So there's 100,000 Wikipedia editors around the world, pretty much in every country of the world, ranging in age from 7 to 70, right? All sorts of different kinds of people, different politics, different ideologies, different religions. Um, many of them never meet, never talk to each other. They might have a few connections inside that big network of people, but many of them don't know any other Wikipedians or don't know very many other Wikipedians. Um, and then the staff of the Wikimedia Foundation now is about 160 people in San Francisco with maybe 30 of those dispersed around the world. So, so we consider ourselves a, a small thing inside a large thing, right? And um, you're right about <clears throat> like the the sort of kind of leadership that is required in that context is really really unusual um, because I have zero control. I don't want any control, and I have no control over the actions of the Wikipedia editors, right? I do have some control over the actions of the staff, but you're right to frame it carefully, right? Because I think that um, I think the command and control authoritarian, I say do it, and they go off and do it, doesn't exist anymore really, right? It, it sort of was a fiction that we chose to pretend to believe in, I think, <laughs> and, and we don't even pretend anymore. Um, when I ran cbc.ca, cbc was 85% unionized staff and pretty strong unions, and so I, I'm used to trying to lead through persuasion and influence yes. as opposed to direct coercive authority because I think it's better in all contexts and it was necessary in that and it's necessary also um, at the Wikimedia Foundation. So I think that's just a changing thing where Wikimedia is more like that than anybody else but we're all moving in that direction. Mm. Um, but I wanted to pick up too on something that you said that, about brand um, because I think that the brand of an organization is um, is is more an accumulation of the daily actions that everybody takes, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can shape it through marketing and so forth, but I think that really people's experience of your brand is their experience of your brand, right? And so at Wikimedia, 100,000 people, um, they make up the brand every day, right? By writing good articles, by making a mistake or not making a mistake, by correcting a mistake, you know? Um, and so I feel like the Wikimedia Foundation actually doesn't influence the brand of Wikipedia very much, nor do we try to, nor do we need to, because I think if the if the if Wikipedia is good and trustworthy, then people will like it and trust it. Yeah, you know, good. Um, here's a, we're getting a version of this question from a couple of, of folks in the audience. Uh, do you think in business women can truly have it all? I bet you've never heard that question before. Um, <laughs> I've never, never heard. Um, how have you balanced your work-life balance and potentially raising a family? And then I have a follow-on to that one. But okay. Um, uh, I can't have it all. <laughs> I don't know about other people. Um, I... Uh, it's such a hard thing, right? It's such a hard thing. It's such a hard area. So I have zero work-life balance. Um, I work 80 hours a week, and you know, the first thing I do in the morning is reach for my laptop. The last thing I do at night is put my laptop down, right? Um, Jimmy Wales, who founded Wikipedia, um, we used to make fun of each other for that because we're both online 24-7. The internet never sleeps, right? Wikipedia is all time zones in the world, so there's always someone who I can talk to about work if I want to. Um, <laughs> So I have zero balance, and I'm 100% okay with that because I love what I do, and I love working, and I'm kind of optimized for work, right? Like, and I've made every decision I've ever made has been optimized for work. So I've always lived within walking distance of where I work, like stuff like that. Like I just I optimize everything for it because I enjoy it, right? Um, so I'm unconflicted about that. Uh, but I have an enormous amount of sympathy for everybody, male and female, right, who would like to have some modicum of balance in their lives. Because I think, 
I think the world is getting really good at eking out every, you know, kind of extracting from people every piece of work value that it can, right? Like we're all always carrying phones, we're all always connected to everything. And, um, and, and I like it that way, but lots of people don't. And it does feel to me like, um, it does feel to me that, uh, that we are, um, it's harder for people to detach, to take a holiday, to take the weekend off, to, you know, have some balance in their lives than it used to be. And so I have a lot of sympathy for everybody on that issue. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned Jimmy Wales. Um, that can, that, that's also an interesting issue that you came into uh, Wikimedia and it was his baby, right? He had, he had founded it, he had built yeah. it to what, whatever it was, even that it was a small organization at that time. How have you kind of figured out how to elegantly work with a founder who clearly still has so much um, commitment to the organization and its success? Yeah, that is such a good question. And um, would, you guys, would you guys be familiar with Founder's Trap? Like, do you know that phrase? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so when I came in, th that was my big question to myself, right? Because I thought, you know, I'm going to go in, and he made it, and I had read about Founder's Trap, um, <laughs> and I was anxious. Um, but what I found was that... Uh, Jimmy actually never aspired to run a nonprofit, right? He was not interested in the Wikimedia Foundation. He's interested in Wikipedia. That's what he loves, yeah. right? So for Jimmy, and I think that this is often the case uh, for people, um, in, in people like him, right, is that they, they want to start it and they want it to succeed and flourish and they have absolutely zero interest in how that happens. They don't really think about it, they don't really care. As long as it does happen, they don't care. And so Jimmy used to say this lovely thing where he would talk about how uh, he, he felt like his job was to be the queen mum in the parade, right? So he would like wave, you know? <laughs> Which was great because nice it was beautiful because it, it, he had, it showed me that he had a really terrific grasp of like seriously what his role was. Like he is in many, I mean he's active on Wikipedia as an editor, but he's also a figurehead and he's an important ceremonial person who he's the founder, he's always going to be the founder. He has an enormous amount of influence that he uses very cautiously because he's very clever, right? Um, but yeah, we didn't have any founder's trap problems at all. He, he, I think he left town about two days after I got to Florida and I didn't see him for six months. <laughs> so That's good. Yeah. <laughs> stay, stay out of your way. So, um, you know, Sheryl Sandberg is in the news right now with her book, Lean In. Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, from my perspective, if you, if you leaned in anymore, you'd fall over. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> right? I, you know... So I don't know. What do you think about her her thesis in general that that um, you know women need to have greater confidence in themselves and push harder and make sure that they make things happen? Uh, and and I guess I'm I'm thinking of it in, in with respect to the two job changes that we know about in your career. One is the one you described. Mm -hmm joining um, uh, Wikimedia Foundation. And the other is your upcoming transition, which you've recently announced um, that you're going to move on because you believe the internet needs more of your attention. So these seem to be very courageous moves that have uncertain outcomes, although I, I'm not trying to get you to reveal any information about right. your plans. But I, I'm just interested in how, um, how you mustered the courage to make these kinds of, of big moves and whether you think this relates to uh, her thesis in, in some way. Um, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. And, 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 and um, yeah, so when I joined the Wikimedia Foundation, I had quit the CBC before I joined the Wikimedia Foundation because I, I wanted to leave and I put so much of myself into my work that it was not possible for me to even think about what I might do next until I cleared the decks, right? And when you're doing that, I can tell you from painful personal experience when you're doing that, it doesn't feel like courage, it feels crazy, right? You feel like a crazy person. Um, and your mother thinks you're crazy. Your mother, and right. <laughs> I was going to ask about your mother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and the mother plays an important role yes. in all of this, right? <laughs> right? Of um, so, so, 
Yeah, I mean, I haven't read Cheryl's book yet, although I want to. I'm really interested in it. Um, I have seen her TED Talk, and I've read a bunch of the reviews of her book, which I'm not sure are doing it any kind of justice, right. because I, I, I find the reception of it so interesting, right? Yeah. We can talk about that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I, 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 I think that she's writing to a very particular audience, right? And I think it's, it's many of the people who are in this room are the people she's writing for, I think, I'm guessing, right? That she is not writing for for, um, she, she's writing for people who are ambitious and smart and relatively of privilege, right? And um, I think that the message that she's sending to those people is probably the right message. Um, if they want what she wants, right? Like it assumes that you want that outcome, right? But if you want that outcome, I think, I think she's correct, right? I certainly have seen, you know, I mean, we know many of the things that she says are so important and, and not well enough understood, right? That women and, um, you know, women and men behaving the same way. The man is fine, the woman is unlikable, right? right. All these sort of, st all the studies that have shown us women don't ask, they don't ask for promotions, they don't ask for raises. Women, um, you know, uh, uh, don't put themselves forward for things. You know, I mean, a lot of that, it, it's much more complicated than that. But I think that what she's trying to do in the book, I think, is she's trying to say, to those women, if you want this thing, here is what is within your control to get it, right? She's not talking about the rest of the culture or what CEO should do or what HR should do or whatever. She's trying to speak directly to women and give them agency. And I think that viewed through that lens, I think she's giving people good advice. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So um, let me ask another uh, audience question. Um, how do you see the free online education world changing? Like Khan Academy, does it only uh, benefit the, the developing world? What's the long-term impact of this medium? And I say that when having read the front page of the New York Times yesterday where, um, well, I saw it as that professors can get out of grading, but that probably wasn't <laughs> what it actually was. <laughs> I know if you saw that. Right? There are all kinds of new spins on how technology can be used um, in educational settings. And this happened to be an article about how you could turn your test in and immediately get a response back and then have an opportunity to rewrite your test hmm. um, in, in, in real time. Um, and MIT and Harvard are collaborating on this idea. So in general, you, you would have an informed opinion on Mm, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I have I have a couple thoughts, but I'm not. You would probably have a more informed opinion no, on this than I would. No, that's not. Um, and I would hesitate to at Hawes, right? Um, but uh, I, I I think that I mean. I think that what's happening right now is that there's a democratization of access, right? And so, you know, I can take an MIT open courseware course, or I can Khan Academy, even TED Talks, right? There's so much more information available than there used to be. And that kind of begs the question um, of, of what is the purpose of education, right? And to, to the extent that the purpose of education is credentialism, right, that's detached from Khan Academy and TED Talks and all of that, right? Like they're about knowing stuff, learning stuff, but they're not going to credential you yet, right? And probably that will change over time. Um, but, but that's the disruptive part, right? The learning stuff is full on great and everybody loves it and, you know, it's fantastic. The, the sort of more question, the still open question is, um, is, does it eventually lead to credentials? Because if it leads to credentials, that's where there's real transformation ability yeah, yeah, in that, yeah. you know. So last question, I can't believe our, our time is just about up, but the last question is, um, you've made the announcement that you're going to leave um, the Wikimedia Foundation, and um, what we talk about in, in our classes in, in leadership here is, what I, I talk about is that the, my view is that the acid test of a great leader is how well the organization does when you're gone. And I guess I would just ask, what, what do you anticipate your legacy being? Why do you think Wikimedia Foundation doesn't need you anymore? Or that they're doing well enough that you can move on to your next thing? Yeah, and, and you don't know, right? You hope, and you don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, so, so it, it actually harkens back, the answer actually harkens back to what you asked about Jimmy, right? So 
Jimmy is the founder of Wikipedia. He's also the founder of the Wikimedia Foundation. I felt like, and I say this without any attempt to be in any way presumptuous, right? But I felt like when I rebooted the organization and moved it from Florida uh, to here, right? We only brought five people with us, and now we're 160 people. The whole thing is completely different. I feel like in some way, in doing that, I became a founder, sort of, of the thing, right? Not a formal founder, but, but it's very much in my image, right? Um, our office, our, our sort of physical plant here. And um, that made me really uncomfortable because there is a thing called the founder's trap and it is a real thing, right? And I, I, I have begun to feel in the last couple of years um, that it's got too much of my stamp on it, which is it's, it's inappropriate for a thing that is democratized and decentralized and a collective and collaborative and open and inclusive. That's wrong, right? It ought not to be one person's vision, right? And so that's part of the thinking behind it for me is that it took me a long time um, to build um, a really rock solid senior team, right? Um, because we are such a weird place. We're so unusual that, um, that everything people learned somewhere else, they have to discard half of it when they come to us. And also, the more experience people have, the more exposure they have to organizational disease, right? And dysfunction. And sometimes they carry that with them, right? And so you have to be really careful to hire people who are healthy, right? Um, <laughs> It's true. I was really surprised. <laughs> you have to be able. You have to hire people who are healthy, and you have to hire people who are intellectually curious and engaged, and willing to discard things that don't work, and constantly iterating towards better. Right. So it's been very, very difficult to hire people who are as flexible and intellectual and curious and smart as what we need. And it was only in the last six months that I felt like I've been able to get that completely solid, the senior team. So yeah. So you never know, right? And it's a leap of faith, and it is sort of terrifying because you know the thing must to be awesome. It needs to be awesome, right? But I think that it will be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a really interesting time. Thank you. And, uh, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. I'm dropping my thing. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Great. 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 Great.